So my presentation is on wedge game and risk mechanics this afternoon. And uh, I'll just start with a very brief introduction, um, just on my background. Uh, so I've been a coach for 20 years. Uh, I've had a strong research interest in short game for the last seven years. Um, and that's involved analysing um, movement patterns of high level wedge players. I've got about 15 players that I would kind of class as that in my, my database at the moment. Um, I've also done some uh, robot studies looking at the effect of strike location on wedge shots. Um, also interviews with, uh, with uh, tour players um, and trying to kind of dive in a little bit and understand how they develop skill in short game um, and also doing a doctorate at the moment in skill acquisition as well. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, my presentation is going to be on what great wedge players do. Um, a little bit on wrist function and its effect on club movement, and then getting into how I use hack motion as a diagnosis tool, uh, a few examples of some poor patterns, and then some, some drills that I use to uh, develop skill with players. So that's kind of really the, the outline of my presentation this afternoon. In terms of my thoughts on wedge play and short game, so I, I like to take a fairly broad view um, I don't think you can explain skill when it comes to short game shots just from one perspective only. So I like to really try and understand things from ball behaviour through to club behaviour, body motion, and then aspects relating to motor learning and training environments as well. Um, because all of those things interact um, for me to, to explain skilled, skilled movement. And what hack motion has really allowed me to do is understand better what's going on at the wrist level um, with, with skilled players and less skilled players. Um, and one of the quotes from one of the guys in my, um, my study interviewing players, uh, a lot of them said very similar. They said club delivery is everything, strike is everything. Um, you know, and definitely can't really argue with that. The ability to deliver the club, um, you know, people are going to make great headway when they, when they improve their ability to do that. So what do great wedge players do, first of all? So this would be just a very quick run through of previous kind of research that I've done. So looking at the players that are the best players that I've measured, coached, um, what they do is they launch the ball very consistently. They launch the ball under 30 degrees, pretty much from everything from about 40 yards up to 100 yards. So very consistent ability to control the launch of the golf ball. And they do that through controlling dynamic loft, angle of attack, and friction. Those would be the three elements that influence the launch of the golf ball. And further kind of stuff that we did was we, you know, great wedge players control distance very well. So launch angle is a factor in that. And we also looked at the effect of mishits and the effect of carry distance on mishits by using the uh, robot testing. So great players have an ability to control the strike as well, which is very much influenced by club delivery. We can see here that, you know, a little bit of a hit out towards the toe on a 75-yard shot, and I'm going to lose about seven or eight yards of carry. So centering the contact has a big influence on distance control. And just coming back on dynamic loft here, the ability to control loft, um, we wanted to try and quantify that a little bit as well. So, you know, good players will deal off the club 12, 15 degrees with a wedge shot. But how much does one degree make a difference? And we did some more stuff with the robot at the testing center. And we said, well, if you change the loft of the club by one degree on a full wedge shot, what effect does that have on the distance the ball travels? And what we found was that for every degree of change, it affected the carry by three yards. So dynamic loft is a, is a big deal. Controlling loft is hugely important and it obviously ties in with, um, with wrist mechanics. And then, after that data, I looked back into some of my players and some of the best wedge players that I coach and looking at, well, what are their track, what are their track man numbers say? And we can see pretty clearly here that on, this is on a 75 yard wedge shot, you know, very high ability to put the correct loft on the back of the ball. So it kind of seems to tie in with the robot data really. Um, another, just before we go on to some hack motion data, another important thing that um, I heard Christoph just mentioning when I jumped on the call about the coupling movements of flexion and extension. So this is an influential paper that I think um, 
it helped kind of me understand it in my mind was the relationship between flexion extension and radial and ulnar, ulnar deviation. And what they did in this study was they basically asked just healthy, healthy individuals to radial and ulnar deviate, so cock and uncock the wrist. And what this shows very clearly is how much motion in the opposite direction um, that they also produced. So there's a you know, considerable amount of extension when someone is just asked to simply radially deviate. And that can be helpful in certain shots, and it can also be very problematic in certain shots. Uh, and that couple also exists in the opposite direction. So when someone's asked to flex and extend, so across the way on the screen here, there's also some secondary movement in radial and ulnar deviation. But we can see that couple is stronger in ulnar and radial deviation for sure. Uh, so we move in, when we move our wrists in one direction, there's a, there's a strong tendency for us to want to move it in another direction as well. And in terms of those, those movements, what effect do they have on the, on the golf club? So when we move towards flexion, we, there's four elements that I think are important that, that happen to the golf club. We, we deal off it, we close the face, we tend to put the center of mass behind the hands at the top of the swing. And also has an, an influence on grip pressure as well, which is probably more relevant to full swing. And on movements towards extension, we do the opposite. So um, on, certainly on full wedge shots, we want more of the top. And on shots from around the green, um, certainly we could be we, we could be using more of the, the stuff uh, at the bottom for, for certain shots. So just moving into, into hack motion, um, so what we're going to look at here is, uh, is how I, I use it to try and bring about those, those numbers at impact and help someone control loft. And we all can use it in different ways. Um, some of us prefer TrackMan style tiles. Some of us like um, tables. Yeah, my preference is to look at the graphs because we can see movement over time. Um, so this is a 75 yard wedge shot. And what I like to do with um, with hack motion is look at is look at each individual hand, and I like to look at each individual movement of each hand separately. Um, that's just the way my brain works. Um, some people will use it differently, and that's I think the beauty of the of the system. Um, and what I can see here is that I'm starting in quite an extended position with my left hand. Um, then I've got some movement out of extension back towards neutral at uh, uh, halfway into my backswing and then add a little bit more at the top of the backswing there and then move down to neutral and fairly heavily down into flexion at impact. And these two lines represent the, the database that I've got, the, the good wedge players that I've I coached kind of converge on those numbers at impact. And that's quite a kind of a normal looking left hand uh, as I see it. So loss of extension and then a little bit of regaining and that kind of makes sense when we look at ulnar and radial deviation in a second. Trail hand, uh, fantastic that we've got trail hand data to look at now um, and trail hand for me is interesting because I see much more similarities between players. The, the, the trail hand and flexion extension looks, I wouldn't say identical, but very, very similar in good wedge players. So it's almost like a, just like an N shape there. So um, like a throwing motion or a slap with the right hand. So we can see there that, you know, heavily into extension, quite a lot of stability through the top, uh, which is again, a characteristic I see of good wedge players and then a fairly rapid move down towards um, flexion, but, but certainly still an extension at impact. So these would all be kind of fairly sort of standard looking. I'll, I'll come back to, to impact just in a, in a second. So I like to look at the numbers separately first, or sorry, the graphs separately. And then I, I like to look at how radio and ulnar uh, interact with that. So I'm looking then at uh, lead hand and trail hand. And this would be the kind of the, the biggest area of problems that I see with wedge players is that they tend to push that lead hand too much into radial deviation, uh, into the backswing into late backswing and we know from the coupling movement that the wrist will then move into extension and that would be the biggest challenge that I would have with wedge players is to is to limit or manage the amount of radial deviation at the top of the backswing. The other thing that I also look for is when maximum radial occurs. So I like to see it occur 
before the top. So there's an element of stability through the top. And I find that makes it a lot easier to organize how we're trying to um, manage flexion extension down towards impact. So I like to look at them individually and then stick them on top of one another. It's just the way that, that, it, that it works for me. So we can see the, the couple kind of uh, happening a little bit here, late backswing, but there's some decent level of stability through the ball and then back down to impact. And if I was going to, no doubt you've had a look at my, my swing there. Everyone's probably uh, critiquing it. Uh, hopefully the list isn't more than uh, sort of 20 things that are wrong. Um, but if I was looking at that myself, what I don't like about that is my continuous movement down into flexion uh, at impact. So you can see, I'm just trying to find my cursor. We can see there that I've just kept moving the my left wrist and kind of driven it hard down into flexion there at impact. So um, to me, that gives us an indication of perhaps the forces that we're applying to the club. So that tells me that I'm driving the handle pretty hard at the ball. And um, that's also potentially a reason why um, I'm staying quite uh, in extending in my trail wrist till very late in the downswing. And that to me ties in with why I have a right miss with my wedges. I tend to miss to the right 90% of the time, yeah, way more than, than left. So if I was going to work on this, I would want to get a little bit more uh, into flexion earlier and then start to throw these angles out a little bit more uh, in order to, to use that as a bit of a squaring mechanism rather than driving quite so hard on the handle. So looking at these graphs give, also gives us a bit of an indication of some of the forces that we're applying to the club as well, which I think is really interesting. Um, so greenside, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, today, but um, I think it's great being able to get some trail wrist data, particularly on um, on short shots. And to me, things get a little bit more complicated around the green. So with trail wrist data, um, it allows us to understand how someone's managing the sweet spot. So for a good chipper or a poor chipper, it's how well they manage that, that sweet spot in space from a back and forward, in and out, up and down perspective. Um, and trail wrist data is kind of, you know, help help me understand that I'm I'm a reasonably good chipper of the ball. I don't usually have too many issues in getting the, the, the sweet spot on the back of the ball. And it allows you to understand if you're a good chipper, why that's happening. And also if someone's a poor chipper, why that's happening. So what I can see from my own data is that I'm increasing the extension in my trail wrist. And if we look at extension, I don't know if you can see me in the in the screen here, but if we're looking at extension just as an isolated movement, that tends to that will move the club away from the, the ball and it will move it off the ground. So we need another mechanism to be able to lower the club down to the ground. And my way of doing that is I'm increasing ulnar. Um, so I actually think the control of ulnar deviation is actually really important for greenside shots. And I think that's a big element in terms of being able to control the height of the the arc that people are producing and, and solid contact. So in terms of round the green, uh, wedge play is, for me, in my mind, it's much simpler in terms of the moves. You know, most people do it in a reasonably similar way, the skilled wedge players. Around the green, it's much more about a decision-making process. So what hack motion has helped me do is make better decisions. So for example, if I'm wanting to get someone to improve spin, or increase or decrease spin. I'm going to look at friction. I'm going to look at spin loft. I'm going to look at club head speed. So, in my decision um, map here, if you like, if I want to, if I want to get the right amount of spin loft to maximise spin, am I going to increase flexion or move away from flexion towards extension? That's going to depend on the shot, the conditions, the player's grip. Um, so. Hack motion just makes me a little bit more informed of what the person's doing and also what they're trying to do. Um, so I'm just going to go into a couple of uh, what I call dysfunctional patterns. So patterns that don't work so well. Um, and I, I, from a coaching point of view, I quite like to, like to look at graphs and then imagine how somebody would move as a, as a result of that. And this is a player who struggles with strike and trajectory control on his um, wedge shots. So we can see here that um, his flexion and extension, he continues to, he's more extended at the top than he was at address. Um, we'd never really see that on good wedge players. 
and then just moves further into extension late into his downswing and then he's almost done in terms of his ability to to manage the loft and then why that's happening for me is that the gradual continuous movement into radial much too long into the backswing um, so what we did actually it was more of a grip issue his right hand grip was too weak um, and we got his grip a little bit stronger and encouraged uh, more move into radial earlier so that it was able to stabilize a little bit more through the top and then it was much easier for him then to get the feeling of moving more down towards flexion uh, at impact so yeah that would be a fairly typical um graph of somebody who is a poor poor wedge player um, this is an example of a, a multiple tour winner around the green so going back to kind of green side now so this is a, a 10 yard chip shot and what we can see here is that he was having some issues with um, contact and just general flight control so we can see there there's a, a fairly excessive move into flexion um, I think about 60 degrees of change over such a short shot and then having to then get that loft back onto the ball at impact um, was really quite challenging. So there was a movement issue there, but also a concept issue. He'd, he'd overdone this idea of wanting to throw the head past the hands. Um, some of that's needed on, on tour to get the softness on landing. But he just kind of overdone this. And what was interesting, so he able to control off, but what was interesting was how it really affected his radio on ulnar. So he was already moving back into radio before he got to, to impact. So that was playing havoc with his contact on the ground, um, as well as obviously some challenges with just, just flight control. So what we did was we ended up here and um, kind of like fairly... A kind of cleaner lines and better control of flexion extension, especially on such a, a short chip shot. And really all we did was we changed grip. So we got him to move more to a putter grip. Um, it kind of happened by, by accident, just through discussion. And what was great was having hack motion just to stick it on. I thought, right, I want to see kind of what these, what this data looks like and how different it looks. Um, so that was really interesting. And it got me thinking about, you know, the importance, this is something I've been exploring at the moment, is the importance of having different grips for different short game shots. So short game is an area where there's so many different shots, so we should have many different grips. Um, it doesn't really make sense or logic to have the same grip when we're trying to deliver the club so differently. Um, and that's something I've kind of been exploring and using hack motion a lot at, for at the moment. So just to finish off, just with some training concepts. So... Um, some drills for effective wrist motions. Um, and that, I'm really interested in a, in a coach is how do you make changes that actually stick? And coming back to some of the interviews that I had with, with tour players, they would describe their short game skill as, well, a lot of them, or almost all of them would say they never had any coaching in short game, right up to tour level. They would spend, they say they said they'd spend a lot of time messing around, around the green, trying stuff out. So there wasn't a heavy amount of coaching going on, but yet high levels of skill developed. So to me, we want to try and invoke changes at the wrist level, but through exploration and problem solving. To me, that's the, the type of coaching I think that's most effective from around the green perspective. Let me show you an example of exploration. And yeah, you'll check out this young lad's wrist conditions. So obviously quite excited about uh, about hitting that shot and that had taken uh, days and weeks for him to be able to to get his hands if we're only talking about the hand level never mind body positions but to get his hands positioned on the club in a way that allowed him to deliver that club and uh, we've been talking a lot about solutions but really what started first here was the problem started before the solution 
And I think a lot of the time in coaching, it works in the opposite direction. We're, we're very intent on giving the solution before we actually set a problem that evokes the solution. And I think that's, that's really important, especially from around the green. So before we teach a technique, maybe we want to try and help the learner s- solve the problem or give them a problem to solve first. So some examples of changing wrist conditions. Um, so a hammer and nail. So to try and improve right arm, trail arm, elbow flexion and extension and trail wrist flexion and extension. So when I give somebody this drill, nobody flips the club. Nobody throws the head past their hands. Literally nobody. Um, now that that golf nail is angled at 20 degrees. That's about a 20 degree attack angle, uh, which is appropriate for that task. So... When you change the task, you change the movement. That's something I I see very clearly um, all the time on the lesson tee. So if we're wanting to make changes at the wrist level, how do we change the task to bring that about? Um, Three wood wedge, this would be another drill that I really like using, which is um, I've cut the the three wood down to the length of a wedge. And conveniently, three wood's got 15 degrees of loft, which is pretty much the amount that we want to take off uh, at impact. So just a very simple drill with a nice visual where we're trying to remove that loft at impact and we bring about some change at the wrist level. Um, what's interesting as well is with this drill, that at this point here, one of the things that I've noticed with the best wedge players that I coach, I'm talking full wedges now, that at this point in the swing here, that that ball on the face will point slightly downwards. So regardless of grip type, so if somebody has a, a weak grip they'll in their lead hand, they'll tend to be more flexed at that point. If someone is more um, stronger grip, they'll be more extended at that point. But we find a way of organizing the movement where the face is pointing slightly down, which then allows benefits in terms of how we pivot, how we move uh, to be able to produce that good impact. A great drill for self-organization. So So just giving someone this very clear task is a great way to evoke changes in movement. Um, We don't kind of need to give them all the answers straight away. So delivering the club onto the wall, as I call it. So it's a two frames post impact is the the reference. And again, an effective one for maybe more established players in terms of making some, some subtle changes. Um, Left hand only, so you change the grip, change the forces. So if somebody gets very um, angular, so I I think of the left hand as it promotes more linear movement of the whole club. Um, Right hand promotes more angular movement, so depending on what you're trying to balance out. um, I think left hand only. It's actually some coaches, I know it's not that popular um, when I've chatted to them about it, but I I do like it for for certain situations. And what's great about it is that we can just stick hack motion on and take a look at it. And um, sadly for me, that looks better with one hand, I think, than it does with uh, two hands. But but there you go. That's probably why I'm coaching and not playing. Um, so in terms of rules of thumb, I think uh, some. I think this can be useful for coaches. So these are changes, changes in motion per distance in terms of flexion, extension, and, and radial and ulna. Um, certainly players sit outside of those ranges, but I think there are good reference points. That, that's all they are is reference points, but not absolutes by, by any means. And finally, live mode, I really like. So helping someone go from concepts to fields, you know, what what is 10 degrees of radial and other deviation? What does that feel like? What is 30 degrees of flexion and extension? What does that feel like? So live mode is great. I use a little mini club with a, with a ball attached to the face and just moving with live mode on is, is tremendous from a, just from a learning perspective and being able to start to feel how, how you know, the type of wrist motions that we're looking for. So just to, to summarize and wrap up, um, 
where I, I feel the huge benefits I've had of, of Hack Motion are it's improved my diagnosis and, and analysis skills and it's improved my decision making, which um, has probably been the biggest benefit. Uh, skill development wise, it's improved um, my ability to see immediate change, but also to look at lasting change. So from a skill learning perspective, um, it's been a useful tool to see if changes are actually sticking and if they're not, why not? Um, so final recommendations would be just uh, for coaches, particularly, you know, maybe young coaches who are watching is use the data carefully. Um, always try and think about how the data is interacting with how someone's body is moving. Um, I think that's really important. Make a lot of swings yourself. Um, I've hit literally hundreds with hack motion on uh, way more than I've looked at with other pupils. Use different implements as well. I managed to get some data with that hammer. So it's interesting we use different implements, what changes at the wrist level and make lots of good and bad swings on purpose as well. I think that's also so very, that's very important. So just last thing there, um, if anyone is interested enough and wants any of the, the, uh, the things that I showed there, that decision map, I'm happy to share that. Also the range of motions that I have, trail and lead wrist, um, if anyone is interested and would like that, they can just get in contact. And also my wedge booklet, uh, anyone is welcome to that as well. Uh, no problem at all. And thanks very much for listening. Uh, a few more uh, questions came in uh, while you were speaking. So number one was people uh, noticed that you have uh, sensors on both hands. So that's... Uh, uh, Stephen was just uh, wearing them, uh, wearing two uh, with two apps in parallel. So you don't uh, get them both in the same app. But if you have two apps and two sensors, then you could connect it that way. But uh, uh, actually, um, I actually use two different machines uh, to get that data, um, Reynolds. So yeah, yeah. So also two devices. Two devices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So uh, it's uh, for for uh, testing purposes. Uh, yeah. Then there was an interesting question. Uh, one coach asked David, uh, "You had too much flexion in your swing at impact. Does that mean that you have too much shaft lean?" Not necessarily. Um, more often than not, what I would see with someone who does that, they would have too much shaft lean, and the smash factor would be a little bit too high on wedge shots. Um, I, I tend to get my dynamic loft into kind of reasonable numbers, but I've got a little bit of a movement off the ball. So sometimes that driving of the handle is what gets my club into impact. That's kind of how I, I can feel my, my pattern work. So more often than not, yes, but not always. Mm -hmm. That's why you want to use the act motion alongside um, launch monitor data as well. Mm -hmm. One question is why would uh, a player struggle to hit a full wedge uh, 54 degrees uh, compared to uh, other irons in the bag. Uh, would you see reasons why, why full wedges would be a bigger struggle for some than uh, full irons? Why would they struggle more with wedges than irons? Um, that's a difficult one, really. I mean, I would say that most people, if they're struggling with unusual, unlikely to see someone who's, who's good with irons, but particularly poor with wedges. I, I think I think it comes back to just, you know, whatever reasons they're struggling to control loft and contact. You know, those are the two big things for me for distance control. It's, it's much less about um, speed awareness, but more that happens as a result of good contact and good control of loft. So, a uh, common one would be, I think, somebody swings the club back too far. So, they, you know, if they're a good um, iron player, they may struggle with their wedges because their concept and how they see the shot is that they're making too big a backswing and then it's quite hard to get the movements that you need into impact um, on partial shots. Definitely see the club going back too far on partial shots, so then difficult to get the impacts that you want from there. Mm -hmm. One question is about what's wrong with extending the lead wrist that it uh, results in more bounce, less dig. What would uh, be your answer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think for certain shots, it's absolutely relevant. I mean, it, it drops back into that decision map that I showed. I mean, it depends. I'm, I'm probably more set on how I think things should be on full wedges, but around the green, it just starts with what is the shot? What are we trying to produce? And then... How do we produce that impact? So 
Uh, some shots we would want more bounce. Um, you know, if we're trying to go maximum spin, and we want to increase spin loft to the highest level, then we would open the face and we'd start to invoke some bounce. Other shots we wouldn't. So it's very shot dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good answer. But bounce is bounce is good on on certain shots for sure. And the, the question about how to in, with a if you have a good ball and a short fifteen yard pitch, and you want the maximum spin, uh, how do they what they need to change to get the higher spin? So maximum spin, um, you're looking at a number of factors really. That's probably a um, not, not a short answer, basically. At the risk level. So, yeah, so we, at the risk level. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we want to produce the highest spin loft that we can. So uh, somewhere 55 degrees would be about the maximum spin loft. So I would say two important factors to do that at the risk level would be we want the club face open, we want a little bit of extension in the wrist, and we also want some rotation as well to be able to keep the loft on the club and then extension through the ball. That's going to keep our spin loft about 55 degrees. Uh, other factors as well are going to contribute to spin as well to bring the smash factor down. But yeah, I would say ex extension and also adding a fair amount of rotation as well to keep the loft on the club. Mm -hmm. uh, in interesting question. Uh, that you mentioned that flexion causes club face uh, to close, but then you mentioned that your right miss is by too much flexion at impact. Uh, could you clarify that? Yeah, so the fle flexion flexion closes the club face for sure, yeah, but also driving the handle creates some global opening. So that closes the face to the path, but also when I push the handle really hard, it creates some opening relative to the target line. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So you've got some closing to the path, but opening relative to the target line. So the harder I push on the handle, the more the club head wants to lay back. It's close to the path, but it's still open to the target line. So I need to then add some twisting of the shaft to be able to square that up. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. thanks for that reply. And then there's a question of, do you see a pattern in swing time for good chippers? Yeah, I think it's definitely an underused element. I'm doing a bit of, um, a bit of testing on that at the moment, but um, I definitely, I think the time well, was a couple of couple of things on that. I would say that poor chippers of the ball, their their total time is too slow. But it's also a bit of a myth when we say that in short game that we we struggle because we don't have as much time as a full shot. So actually, on a ten yard chip, the club is taking slightly longer to get to the ball than it does on a full seven iron. So actually, downswing wise, we have more time on a chip than we do on a full shot. Interestingly enough, it's only a fraction. But I try to get people to think of the timing of short game shots as more like chip shots. So from a, a motor control perspective, they're more similar programs. That's another discussion, but they're far more similar. When we're making full swing times on short game shots, I see people running into problems there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one more question uh, about changing grips for different shots. Do you re recommend weakening lead hand grip to add dynamic loft for sand shots? Uh, yes, but also it's a good, it's a good question. So um, if I want to get, say, my left hand more cupped, if we think about the couple, the more we add, we add radial, the more we'll cr create some cupping. So I like to get the feeling of a lot of radial in a bunker shot. So if I want to, more, want to get more radial in a bunker shot with my trail hand, I would start more uncocked because that gives me more ability to add radial. I mean, I can add more radial, I can add more cupping. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think more around changing trail hand than, than lead hand. You could definitely weaken the lead hand, but I actually think about positioning my trail hand differently to be able to get more of the club face more open because I want more radial to be able to cut the left wrist. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, one more. Uh, if you add force on the handle, is it not bringing the club head higher in relation to the ground, leading to potential chunks and double hits? Yeah, well, you've also, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but you've also, it depends on how you're applying it because you've also got force that's moving the club forward and around as well. 
So it would also depend on how you're managing the force that's moving the club around and up. So, um, yeah, it's not a straight line force. It's moving in, in different directions. So it's managing that whole element, I would say, that's important. If it was just moving purely in a straight line, it potentially might straighten. The question is, what if your exit is too long and too low post-impact? Uh, is that a lead wrist issue? If your exit is... Long and low post-impact. I wouldn't really think about it as a wrist issue. I would think about it more as, as how the body's moving. But I would try and think about how the the wrist movement is interacting to cause that. But I'm not really that clear on... I probably need to see what the person is describing to really understand that. 